Okay, well, I'll get started with intros while we wait for a few more participants to, uh, to log on. Um, so welcome everybody to today's panel. I know uh, a lot of you are either very uh, sleepy after all the judging you've gone through, uh, or very excited to know what the results are. And uh, believe me, uh, I've been in your shoes, so I, I know the feeling. Uh, so my name is Barnes, Barnes Monteith, and I'm here to keep this panel running along smoothly. Uh, I've been here at the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair now for over 25 years, uh, most of which I've served in the leadership role. And uh, um, I'm actually the most recent previous chair of the organization, current vice chair. Uh, our fair has been held at MIT now for uh, over 73 years now. And we have a very strong connection to the faculty and the research groups at MIT. Uh, as well as the institution itself. Uh, our, our fair has been held there continuously the entire time, right up until the pandemic. Uh, in the past, I actually did some research right here at uh, MIT Media Lab as well on AI relating to my own science fair project as a kid, like probably many of you today. Uh, so today we're here to introduce an amazing person uh, with a very strong connection to MIT as well. This is Thomas Washington. He's a graduate of MIT receiving his bachelor's and master's in aeronautics and, and astronautics. Uh, and he's a former member of the United States Air Force, a test pilot at Aurora Flight Sciences, and a researcher and pilot at the MIT affiliated Lincoln Labs. And what I think is really cool about him is that he's not just an aerospace engineer, but he's also a jet pilot and a test pilot. And he's a very cool nerd indeed. So I'll let Thomas introduce more about his background and why he's here to inspire all of you with his story here today. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for the intro, uh, I guess, Barnes. Um, so, uh, yeah, cool nerd. That, that's that's interesting. I haven't been called that for a while. But uh, so I guess I'm here. I'll just give you guys a little background, I guess, on who I am and how I got from where you guys are to where I am and uh, and uh, you know if you got any questions or or things just to kind of give you a, a flavor of of why I did this whole science thing why it was why it was fun for me and and how I turned it into something that uh, I've been doing for a long time now so um, so with that I guess I'll share a share a screen here if I can do that. Uh, <clears throat> that and and go presentation mode. Okay, so the beginning. So who am I? Uh, so yeah, this is me. Um, I was uh, born in Maryland um, and uh, grew up there. And as you can see, you know, these are kind of three pictures from me at various times in my life. I guess this, I was eighteen here. I was, geez, 36 here and I guess 49 here. But um, uh, went to MIT, as uh, Barna said, um, had a good time there. Uh, and then since there, I've been kind of working in this whole world of, you know, science and engineering, mainly kind of at the intersection between what I call, you know, airplanes and uh, airplanes and and engineering is um is kind of where I, I like to live. So uh, so with that, all right, so how did I get started? Um, what was my you know trigger or I'd say people call it the spark to, to get me going? So um, when I was yeah, yeah, back in 1983, um, long time ago, so uh, as a kid, I was already kind of obsessed with airplanes. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar. So I, I used to go to these, you know, open house air shows that, um, that they had at the military bases. So again, I grew up in Maryland. So there were two really, really close to me. One was uh, actually both in Maryland. It was Andrews Air Force Base and Patuxent Naval Air Station. Um, so twice a year, um, I was there, you know, watching these these uh, you know airplanes do amazing things um, and. Uh, uh, you know, it was clear to me that, you know, if I could get paid to do that, that would be, you know, one of the greatest things I could possibly do. So um, at the same time, you know, I was kind of, we should say mechanically inclined, you know, I like to tinker with things and work on things. I was pretty good with 
working with my hands and things. And 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 in school wise, I, I you know I kind of generally got good grades. So and uh, particularly in kind of the math and science world, this was before they coined the term STEM. So it was you know it was just you know math and science to me. So, but then I. Uh, this movie came out, this movie called The Right Stuff. And I don't know if, we, again, it's a movie from 1983, but it was all about this, this, this concept of this test pilot, which was, it was like this perfect combination of, you know, people who flew airplanes and people who, you know, understood, you know, science and, and what they were doing. This was kind of at the beginning of, you know, the space age back then. And, um, and, uh, and that, pretty much kind of did it for me. You know, I was kind of hooked. I've, I figured out that, hey, you know, you can combine, you know, this world of airplanes with this, you know, kind of this other world and and get to do things that, you know, nobody else, you know, nobody else has done before. And um, so that, that was kind of it for me. So pretty much from then on, um, I spent most of my time trying to figure out, um, how I could get from where I was to, you know, to, to be that, that person. So, um, so to me, that meant that, you know, you need to go to school. I needed to have an engineering degree and I needed to fly airplanes. So those were the kind of the two big things that I needed to, to put together to, to make this path work. So, so the first step in that path, you know, I decided, okay, if I wanted to be an engineer, you know, where would I go to, to learn about engineering? And, uh, of course, you know, if you do any type of search or anything, you know, back then, this was before the days of the internet. So, you know, you had to go to the library or, <laughs> or talk to people then. And uh, MIT was the number one on the list. So that's where I applied. And luckily I got in. And, um, and uh, so, you know, as Marna said, I, I was a, uh, obviously engineering major in aeronautics, and astronautics. Um, if you hear people at MIT talking that, you know, they talk about numbers, so that's course 16. Um, and uh, during my time there, there over the summers, um, you know, you had jobs and most of them were for various, you know, either aerospace companies or, or so I did a little work uh, in the summer internship at NASA. Um, I went to the GE aircraft engine plant that's in Lynn, Massachusetts there. And uh, I worked for a small company, what was then a small company in, in Virginia, which was uh, Aurora Fly Sciences. Um, but at school, you know, it wasn't all work because um, that would just drive me crazy. Uh, so, I, you know, I ran track, you know, participated in other, you know, activities that, that were going on at the, the Institute there to, uh, you know, to, to kind of break things up. and. You know, to me, the biggest things, you know, as you guys are thinking about what you're going to do and how you're going to go about doing it, you know, the things that I kind of take away from my time in, in college was, you know, no matter where you go um, or what you're going to do, um, this I tell my kids the same thing too is that one of the biggest things you can do is 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 to learn. As to, I call it, I call it learn how you learn, right? So what that really means is. You're going to spend, you know, four years or, or more in school, you know, learning something. But the the thing that you actually learn or you specialize in may not necessarily be what you're going to do for the rest of your life. But the point is, is that while you're going through this process, you need to understand how you acquire knowledge, how you um how you understand things, the method of how are you, you know, some people say I'm a visual learner, I, you know, I need to read it, I need to write it, whatever, whatever your method is for how you can grasp a new concept and actually put it to use um, is one of the, the biggest things that you can take away from any um, academic experience because that's a skill that you're gonna use for the rest of your life, uh, I say. Um, but if you're gonna do engineering also, you know, you can't just do it in books all the time, you know, you got to get your hands dirty, you, you build things, make things, you know, figure out how things work. Um, uh, you know, fundamentals are always the key. So, you know, things get more and more complex, but generally complex problems can be broken down into simpler problems. And, you know, that's, that's the best way to approach them. And at all levels, you really need to also, you know, you're a technical, you maybe want to be a technical type person, 
but you need to also be able to communicate your ideas to people, whether that be in written form or, or, or spoken form or whatever the case may be. So don't forget about those things. And also, you know, have fun. Don't forget about the things that you like doing as you're along the way. So that was cool. Um, so that was the first thing, going back to my original thing about how do I, how do I do a test, be a test pilot? I needed an engineering degree. So I got that. Now I needed to fly airplanes. So I decided to uh, join the Air Force. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, that's what I did. I, I spent probably a little over a decade in the Air Force. Um, most of my time was flying airplanes. So it was a great, great time. I, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I'm not going to read the list of places and things that I was doing over the years, but, you know, this collage of kind of pictures here is kind of a smattering of, of, of the, you know, airplanes that I flew in, in different places. And, you know, this is my, my hero shot here of me at, uh, at uh, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, my, my last uh, assignment before I uh, separated. But the key thing here is, you know, I highlight these two <laughs> things. So I finally got there. So this is United States Air Force Test Pilot School. So at the graduation of that, I was officially a test pilot. So I made it. I, you know, been there, done that. I got the T-shirt to prove it. And um, you know, my next assignment was as a, as a, uh, a test pilot at uh, for the Air Force at uh, Eglin. Spent three years there before I uh, separated from the service and went on with the rest of my life. Um, so the big things here again, you know, similar kind of themes. You know, what do I take away from that? Is you know, if you have some crazy dream or you think it's a crazy dream or something that you really, really want to do, just do it. I mean, I know that sounds simple, um, but, um, but you know, it'll take obviously a lot of, it'll take a lot of effort, a lot of work, but if it's something that you really want to do, don't let people talk you out of it, you know, um, figure out what you need and be methodical about it. Figure out what you need to get from point A to point where you wanna be and be methodical about it and uh, and pursue it. Um, you know, for me, yeah, I wanted to get to this magical thing of being a test pilot, but you know, it's not necessarily about that in particular goal as I found out, you know, going through it is that that journey to get there was also um, a, a part of the, uh, a part of the, the enjoy. I mean, it was, it was a great time. Um, so, you know, you can't really, if I had just gone from the beginning to the end, I would have missed everything that's in the middle. And, and, and that was the, that middle part was, was great. So, um, again, so there you go. So now what do I do? Um, separate from the military and, uh, go back to civilian life. So I, I go to work for, you know, Aurora Fly Sciences. So I, if you recall, I had been an intern there before. So now I'm going back there as a uh, working for a private company. Excuse me. And I had multiple jobs along the line. Again, I spent another probably like 10 years there. Multiple jobs along the line, which are listed here. Um, again, I'm not going to read them to you. But the bottom line is this was kind of my first experience to a private company, you know, engineering firm who whose job was to build things and and um, and. Uh, I guess to make things and um, design things and sometimes things that you know people didn't think could be done. So um, uh, it was de but definitely diff different from my time in the military. Um, it was uh, a time for me to go back into my brain of things that I learned when I was in school and, and to dust those things off and to be able to put those those um, analytical skills back to use in terms of, in, instead of, you know, just the, the kind of the pilot skills. Um, but it was, you know, a combination of both, which is kind of goes back to the whole thing of, you know, learning how you learn and, and not forgetting the basics because um, in some cases I had to, you know, pick up things that I hadn't done in, you know, 10, 15 years um, to be able to do that, the, the work that I did there. Um, so, um, the, yeah, pictures on the left are kind of, you know, the company actually did very well, uh, while I was there. I mean, we had many, many projects. Most of them were kind of in the unmanned, um, aircraft world, optionally piloted aircraft. You know, we had several, uh, programs that we worked on that ended up being on the cover of, you know, major, um, 
major, I guess, industry magazine, Aviation Week, if you're familiar with it. So, um, so uh, we did well. Um, you know, things that I picked up along the way is that, you know, when you think about some of the things that we did, um, you know, complex, unmanned, highly unstable aircraft type things, um, very complex problems, but essentially, you know, we took those complex problems and broke them down into, you know, simple ones that we could solve, you know, kind of repeatedly. And then that's how we built upon to, to, to address this, this major um, complex issue. The other thing about it is that, and I'm sure you guys are seeing this, not just in school, but in projects that you do with collaboration with, you know, your peers is that engineering and really in any science engineering, in my opinion, is kind of a, is, is a very collaborative effort. Um, there are very few things that you can do, you know, on your own um, in, an, in isolation. So um, uh, again, it goes back to the whole thing of being able to communicate your ideas to others and to be able to work with others and, and in order to, to do something, um, do something uh, amazing. Um, so similarly with that, since it is collaborative, you kind of need to be, so I was a aeronautical engineer. What does that mean? That means I dealt with, you know, the, the physics and the math associated with um, what made, you know, airplanes fly, what made, you know, um, how rockets, you know, work and, and things like that. But at the same time, um, in these systems, these airplane systems, you know, they involve other disciplines, engineering disciplines as well. They involve, you know, electrical engineering. They involve, you know, um, computer science. They involve, you know, software. So you have to, you may not be the expert in all of those different fields, but you kind of really need to understand how those fields are going to come together and where they're going to come together and, and how to, uh, how to, how to make them, I guess, work uh, in order to, again, you know, build a complex, a more complex system. Um, <laughs> the bottom one, uh, I think, is also important. So, from an engineer, when you're in, as an engineer, which is a little different than being a scientist, at least in my mind, this is kind of how I separate scientists and engineers. You know, scientists do things, and their objective is to get the the perfect, the pure answer. You know, in engineering, it's more of kind of an answer that's good enough to do a particular task. So um, engineering, in my opinion, is all about estimation, right? I mean, it's how close do you really need that answer to be in order to, to do the job that you're, you're talking about. You're not always going to have the perfect, you know, closed form, you know, solution. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be an estimate. And that's one of the things you're going to have to develop a feel for as you get experience is, is to what's actually good enough. Um, so. Um, then the third phase of my life is kind of where I am right now. Um, I decided to come back to uh, MIT um, in a different capacity, obviously. So I don't know how many folks are aware, but um, so MIT Lincoln Laboratory, what is it? <laughs> it's what's called, I guess, a federally funded research and development center, as it says on the slides. But it, really what it is, it's a place. Um, it is a technically a private company but it has a special relationship with um, government agencies, if you will, um, because we're, there are a lot of smart people there. And essentially when the government has a really difficult problem that they want to do essentially that they want an answer for, um, they turn to places like the Lincoln Laboratory and there are other FFRDCs that are out there, you know, like, you know, Los Alamos, um, Sandia National Labs, there's, you know, there's, there's, I forget how many there are, but there's several of them out there. But essentially what they are is they're focused, concentrated groups of people who are there with the sole purpose of helping um, solve problems which are of national interest. Um, one of the things that's unique about the one at MIT is the fact that as part of solving the problems that we do, we do a lot of what's called rapid prototyping, which means we come up with a concept to solve a problem, we uh, build a prototype, and then we test it. And um, that's kind of our, in a nutshell, kind of our, our method of, of how we approach things, which means we do a lot of tests. 
Um, and some of that test involves um, systems that need to uh, be airborne or need to essentially, in order to collect the data that they're, they're looking for. So as part of that, the lab has what they call a flight test facility, which is a, uh, is a, um, is a facility where we have a small fleet of you know, highly modified airplanes <clears throat> that we use to support the uh, the labs ex airborne ex labs experiments that need to um, that need to fly on airplanes. So um, uh, so this picture up top is just a picture of the laboratory. I guess uh, an airborne picture of the laboratory. It sits out in uh, Hanscom. It's in just on the other side of Lexington. Um, and uh, this is a obviously a picture out in front of the flight facility, which is uh, not at this exact location. It's on uh, Hanscom Air Force Base. It's about a mile away. There's, these two places are about a mile away from each other. But essentially, we have a hangar full of airplanes, and uh, we use these airplanes to conduct experiments for the lab. And um, so <laughs> the interesting fact is I was at MIT as a student for like seven years. I vaguely knew that there was this thing called the Lincoln Laboratory. But I definitely did not know that the Lincoln Laboratory flew airplanes. And so it's been there since 1951, and uh, doing this, doing this task, and doing this job, and um, you know, didn't know it. So you guys know more than I do at at, at my stage. So what do I do? Uh, so as part of that, like I said, I work in the flight test facility. So as part of that, you know, I work with the uh, the different um, divisions and groups within the lab proper that need to do these experiments. So I help them with essentially the planning phases of, you know, because these people don't know anything about airplanes, they're, they're experts in their particular um, line of work. So I help them, you know, pick the airplane what they want to use. Um, we help them with the whole modification process, you know, the design, um, where they wanna fly, how they wanna fly, what, what data they wanna collect. Um, and then as far as conducting the tests, you know, we fly the airplanes most times with um, the engineers in the back, you know, uh, working their systems. A lot of their systems are essentially based, you know, radar based, um, optical, you know, that type of thing. Um, as well as, you know, obviously we have to modify these airplanes and part of that modification, you know, we have to test them to make sure that, you know, they're still safe to do what we're trying to do. And, um, and uh, to assess what the performance are and, and handling qualities, meaning does the airplane still behave like the pilot would expect it to behave? Because now we're gonna load this airplane up with a bunch of engineers in the back and we're gonna go and you know, fly around you know, Massachusetts and other places of the country to collect data for them. Um, so, so there's a whole process associated with um, doing that safely and um, effectively. So that's, that's what we do. Um, uh, <clears throat> so last thing on that one would be is, you know, kind of the lesson learned there would be is, you know, for me, again, it's the same, the same thing comes up, you know, learn how to learn. Don't forget what you already knew and don't be afraid to learn new things because, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 52 years old now, but I, you know, I still, I still try to keep abreast of, of, of things that are out there that affect the work that I do so that I'm, you know, not, um, so that I can, uh, so I can be effective at the job that I'm, I'm, I'm doing. Um, because if I had essentially turned off my brain and stopped learning when I got out of school, you know, 30 years ago, um, I, I would not be nearly as effective at, at any of this, um, this work that I do today. So, um, so back to the beginning, you know, the whole spark thing of what started it. For me, it's still there because, like I said, I still enjoy being at that intersection of engineering and aviation, and that's where I've that's where I've lived for, you know, the past, like I said, uh, probably twenty five ish or more years. Um, I still make use of the things that you guys are learning now. Um, the math and physics that you guys are doing, that you're doing in high school and that you'll do in college, if you decide to pursue that route, I, I still use them. So, you know, people sometimes say, you know, oh, when are you ever going to use this type of stuff? Well, 
<laughs> depending on what your field is, uh, you'll use them for the next 30 years. So, uh, so like I said, don't forget the basics. And um, so as an example of, you know, what do we do? So this is uh, just a, a photo of one of the airplanes that we operate. And in terms of the modifications that we do, we added this big bulge on the back of the airplane. We added this thing to the bottom of the airplane and we added this thing to the bottom of the airplane. Now, the big questions that we ask are, okay, what's, what's the effect of, of doing all this on this airplane? And so in terms of safety, you know, can it still take off in the runway that we have? You know, how fast can we go? How high can we go? Because that determines, you know, what we can do with the airplane. And again, back to the pilot thing is, you know, is it going to behave like the pilot expects the airplane to behave? So that those are the, the kind of problems that we solve when we um, when we modify these uh, these airplanes associated with uh, the work that we do at the uh, flight test facility. So, so that's me in a nutshell. I won't uh, maybe ran a little long here, but if you got any questions, um, I think there's one in the chat there. Yep, it looks like there's uh, one one question here. Uh, someone has asked. Um, Nevin has asked, in terms of logistics, if someone wants to conduct a study, would they be the ones paying for expenses to conduct that study? And uh, what type of aircraft does Lincoln Labs uh, operate? Uh, so in terms of logistics, um, if one wants to conduct a study, would they be? So the way it generally works, yes. So the, to answer your question, essentially, yes. So, um, uh, an agency or you know some organization says, "Hey, we want to we want to study this." Then yes, they they either they pitch it to the lab. The lab essentially develops a proposal and submits that to the government to say, "Hey, here's what we want to look at." Or the government comes to us and says, "We want you to look at this." And yes, we tell them, "Okay, in order to look at it, here's what we're going to do, and it's going to cost you this much, and it's going to take this much time." And yes, they end up you know paying for that that work. Um, what aircraft do we operate? Uh, so right now we have everything from a Gulfstream 4, which is a 75,000 pound, you know, business jet to a Cessna 206. Um, in the middle there, we have, you know, a Saab 340, which is a turboprop commuter airplane. We have uh, twin otters, which are smaller twin turboprop. And um, uh, we have another Gulfstream 2, which is about to be retired and get replaced by another Gulfstream 4. So that's kind of the range of airplanes that we, we operate. Um, ah, your There's last another question about opportunity yes. for high school students. Yes. Yes. So here's my last slide. I'll show you that one. And uh, I'm sure these slides will get to you guys. But here you go. That's a straight answer. So the lab runs uh, outreach programs that are kind of, some of them are kind of summertime type things. And um, some of them are uh, over, you know, kind of like winter break type things. But um, here are the two major ones. And like I said, if you want more information about these, to me is um, obviously you guys will have these slides so you can look at the, the text there, but that email address right there is where you would go to uh, to request more information, and you can also look at the the Lincoln Laboratory uh, website because um, it has all the um, the details about these opportunities as well. So, excellent question. All right. Well, we're coming up on uh, right now at eleven thirty, and it looks like there's uh, not too many other uh, questions out there at the moment. So I, I just want to take this opportunity to to really, uh, on behalf of uh, the Mass State Science Fair, I want to uh, thank you, Thomas, for being here today. It's not too often that you hear about someone who's really academically talented and has done so well uh, in in uh, in in the space of of, uh, of smart things that MIT kids and science fair kids <laughs> like to do uh, as far as, as as STEM and academics, but then go out there in, in the real world and, and you know you expect people are going to spend their their lifetime in a laboratory, but you really went out there and, and did something all of us dream about, which is you know jumping in a in a plane and 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 being a test pilot. <laughs> That's really awesome. That's really that makes you very that makes you my hero. So th thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Like I said, it's uh, it's it was good. You know, it's good to do. I always like talking about airplanes, so you know that's easy. For me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Great. Well, we we uh, we hope you'll come back to the to the science fair again and uh, and do this with uh, hopefully more crowds of students. And and we really really appreciate you being here today. Th thank you very much. Yep. You're welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. Yeah.